Welcome back. So in the last lecture, we talked about the compressed sensing problem and how under some circumstances you can get away with measuring far fewer uh, measurements than your full system. So it, let's say that X is an image, uh, which is sparse in Fourier space. You can get away with measuring a massive subsampling of the pixels in X, so maybe only 10 or 20% of the pixels in X, and you can infer what the sparsest vector S that satisfies this measurement equation is. And once you solve for that sparse vector S, the sparse vector of Fourier coefficients, you can inverse Fourier transform and reconstruct your full image. So this sounds kind of like magic. Um, it's not, and I'm going to walk you through conditions on when this will and will not be possible. Okay, so just to remind you, this is kind of the picture we're dealing with here. Uh, we have some measurement matrix C. We have some universal encoding basis Psi. I'm going to think of this as a Fourier or a wavelet basis, but it's a big N by N matrix, um, hopefully orthogonal, unitary, that kind of nice properties of Psi. And S is a sparse vector that is basically our full image Fourier transformed or wavelet transformed. Okay, so we're trying to solve for S. We know Psi, everyone knows Psi, it's just the Fourier basis. We know C, we know which pixels we're measuring, and we know Y, we know the value of those pixels that we measured. And so what we're trying to do is solve for S, the sparsest vector out of all, there's infinitely many vectors S that satisfy this underdetermined system. We're trying to find the sparsest S that satisfies this using an L1 optimization. And I'll just write that up again. We're going to try to find um, the minimum one norm S uh, such that Y minus C Psi S is either equal to zero or less than some epsilon. I'll just say less than some really, really small number because uh, that's more general. Okay, so we're basically trying to find an S that almost approximates, almost equals almost satisfies this equation, even if there's a little bit of measurement noise. That's what this says. And we're trying to find out of all of those infinitely many S's, we're trying to find the one that is the sparsest, which is going to be achieved by this one norm uh, regularization. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. Now I'm gonna walk you through what are the conditions when you can expect this to work and not work. Okay, so the first really, really important condition is something called incoherence. So what we need is C to be incoherent, uh, sometimes I feel incoherent, C needs to be incoherent uh, with respect to Psi. Okay, this is a really, really important condition. I'm gonna tell you exactly what this means. But basically what it means is that I need the rows of C to be kind of, um, orthogonal to the rows of psi, to the columns of psi. If my rows of C are really, really parallel to any columns of psi, then they're essentially only measuring that column and they don't give me information about the other column. So remember the trick, not, not the trick, the, uh, the, the big point here is that psi is a universal basis that could encode anything. This S could be the Fourier coefficients of a picture of a mountain, or a dog, or a human face, or a coffee cup. This is a very expressive library. And if my, if my rows of C are too parallel with any columns of Psi, then essentially those Cs are only measuring those columns of Psi, and we lose the full generality of the library. So C must be incoherent with respect to Psi, which means that uh, kind of in words, uh, C cannot be too, uh, oops, So in words, what this means is that C cannot be too parallel uh, to any columns of Psi, to Psi. So C cannot be too parallel to Psi, okay? Uh, and I'm gonna give you some examples of good measurement matrices and bad measurement matrices to walk you through this, okay? So these are all different types of good measurement matrices that you could use that would be incoherent with respect to this basis Psi. 
Okay, so our example of random uh, pixels or random kind of point measurements here is a good one. Uh, you could also generate this C from a Gaussian normal distribution, so like a, just a, every pixel is randomly distributed. That's this one. Uh, you could have kind of a Bernoulli distributed where you basically flip a coin on every single entry of C and it's a zero or a one. Uh, you can also have sparser masks, like a kind of a sparse Bernoulli uh, mask here. And the point is that all of these have some randomness built into how you're measuring, okay? And uh, that's really, really important because if I don't have randomness built into this measurement matrix C, then I'm probably going to be measuring certain features in Psi more than others. These random measurement matrices are with high probability kind of sampling the full column space of psi so that this, uh, this vector y has information about s no matter which columns s is exciting. Okay, So these measurement matrices have to excite all of the columns of psi unless uh, if you want s to be you know, any signal reconstruction. Okay, So that's really important is that you need C to be incoherent and generally this is achieved through randomness. Now I will point out that although mathematicians love these Gaussian measurement matrices because it's easy to prove theorems, these are not very practical in a lot of engineering applications. Like I don't know if it's easier to take a megapixel image and take Gaussian random linear combinations of all of the pixels to create all of the entries of Y. That actually might be harder. Uh, to generate this, this Gaussian measurement. These single pixel measurements are extremely engineering relevant because in many situations a single pixel means a single spatial measurement. So if I'm measuring the ocean, a single pixel is measuring at one point in space. And so I personally like these sparser kind of uh, single pixel measurements even though they're maybe not as mathematically as nice uh, or as robust as these, these Gaussian measurement matrices. That's just kind of an aside. And I'll also point out that single pixel measurements, kind of delta functions in space, are almost optimally incoherent with respect to Fourier bases. Remember that, that delta functions excite all Fourier frequencies, and so these little delta function measurements are actually really, really good when you pair them with a discrete Fourier transform or discrete cosine basis. Okay, So that's also really cool. An example of a terrible measurement matrix uh, would be if I literally just took columns of psi and transposed them. This would be a terrible measurement matrix. You can see I just picked columns of psi and transposed them. And I'm going to walk you through why this is such a bad measurement matrix. So there should be an equal sign here. y equals c times psi times s. If I measure in this way, c times psi is only going to excite those columns of psi that are parallel to these rows of C. And so this is literally the theta matrix. All of these matrix examples, by the way, are actual data and actual optimizations that I've run to, to find, um, you know, th these are actual, actual matrices. So this C times this psi equals this theta, okay? And you'll notice here that this theta is not measuring any of these frequencies here in, in S. Okay, It is an identity for these super high frequencies. It's not measuring any of the low frequencies of S. So the way I think about this is that this C matrix is measuring this portion of the Fourier transform. So it's able to pick up this frequency here, but it's not able to get any information about these frequencies here because it's not exciting any of these columns of Psi. Okay, so this is an exceptionally bad measurement matrix because it is very coherent with respect to Psi. Okay, I hope that was somewhat coherent. The basic idea is that we want our rows of C to be not parallel to any columns of Psi. We want them to be a linear combination of all of the columns of Psi so that each of these measurements Y is telling us information about all of the potential entries of S. Okay, good. The other piece uh, of the puzzle here is how many measurements we, we need to take. So this vector s is called k sparse if it has k non-zero entries. Okay? So if this thing has five non-zero entries, it's five sparse, or k sparse with k equals five. And so I have to measure more than k to find those k non-zero Fourier coefficients. And so my number of measurements 
my number of measurements, and sometimes I call this P, P is my number of measurements, it has to be proportional or on the order of uh, K log N over K, where K is how sparse my signal is, N is the original dimension of my, uh, my full dimensional measurement. You know, this might be a million if it's a million pixel image, okay? And so what this tells us is that the more sparse my signal is, if K is like two, I can get away with not that many measurements. P is gonna be on the order of two times log one million over two. And you know, log of a million over two is like six. It's not bad, okay? So this is small if k is small, but as k gets bigger and bigger and bigger, maybe this is only 10,000 sparse, then this is actually a lot of pixels. I need to, order, I need to measure more than 10,000 log n over 10,000 pixels, okay? So this scales uh, kind of almost linearly in the sparsity of, x, uh, of, of s, but there's this log n over k. And notice anytime you see an order here, you should be asking yourself, there is a constant out here. So this actually equals some, some constant times k uh, log n over k, where this constant k1 uh, depends on how incoherent c is with respect to psi. So this is related uh, to c and psi, and essentially to their inner product, to how incoherent or how coherent they are. Okay, so better measurements, C, allow me to take fewer of them. Okay, but as a back of the envelope for the best measurements you can think of, let's say delta function, single pixels for Fourier, this K is gonna be at least around three or four, something like that. And so for example, if I had a megapixel image, let's say I had one megapixel image, so N equals 10 to the sixth, and most images, let's say I have um, in a 10 to the sixth image, I need to keep like, I don't know, uh, this is a little dangerous to do live. Let's say I need to keep 10 to the four sparse. That's, and this is really low. It should be a little higher than that, maybe closer to 10 to the five, okay? Then I'm gonna need to take at least some constant uh, 10 to the four times log of n over 10 to the four, that's log of 100 and you get to decide if that's log base e or 10, uh, I don't really remember, times this constant I said was related to the incoherence, but is usually about, I don't know, five, right? So this is, if it's log base 10 of 100, that's two times five times 10 to the four is about 10 to the five, okay? Or 10% of our original image. So if I wanna keep, if I wanna keep 1%, of the original image, I need to measure 10% of the pixels randomly, okay? This is super back of the envelope. You might need to measure a little more or a little less. Maybe your signal's not actually this sparse. Maybe it's more like 5%, in which case this would go up a lot, okay? But that gives you just an idea of how you would work this equation to get the number of measurements that you would need to take, okay? Uh, okay, good. So. That tells you kind of what types of measurements you need to take, how many measurements you need to take. I will point out, and this is really important, there was a big advance in applied math 15 years ago that allowed us in, to, to solve this system of equations for the sparsest S. It is now possible, okay, without a brute force combinatorial search. It's, it's now a convex optimization to solve for this sparsest S if these two conditions are satisfied, okay? And if these are satisfied, then you get something called the restricted isometry property, the restricted isometry property. And what that means is that C times psi, this big measurement matrix, acts like a unitary matrix, like an isometry matrix. It acts like a unitary matrix on sparse vectors, on sparse vectors, S. And remember that unitary matrices 
will rotate pairs of vectors, but it'll preserve the angle between them and kind of the distance between them. And that's exactly what we want uh, when we're doing this compressed sensing problem, is uh, we want this c times psi to kind of preserve the geometry of sparse vectors. And if these two conditions are satisfied, then there are rigorous mathematical results saying that you have this restricted isometry property, which means at least for sparse vectors, for k sparse vectors s, this measurement matrix acts like an isometry or a unitary matrix. And so kind of the ge geometrical information in, in pairs of vectors here is preserved in pairs of vectors here. And that's, that's at least uh, gives you a flavor for the mathematics underpinning why you can do this optimization. But I will point out that just because you can solve the system of equations doesn't mean it's easy. This is extremely, extremely expensive to solve for this S given these measurements Y, especially for a large megapixel image. I mean, at least when I used to do this, this is kind of supercomputer type computations. And there are better and better algorithms coming online to solve this, but this is by no means cheap. Okay, it's possible, but it's not it's not inexpensive. It's not uh, it's not inexpensive. So, when would you want to use this? Well, there are some applications where measuring the full resolution X is really really expensive, and speeding that up or measuring less of this might save lives. That's a great example of when you'd want to use compressed sensing. Okay, so for example, one of the classic examples of when compressed sensing uh, has been used is for infant MRIs in, in hospitals. Okay, so if you want to get an MRI of a really, really small baby, they're moving around all the time. You can't tell them to lay still because uh, we're taking this measurement. So you have to sedate them. Okay, and if you take and sedate that child for two minutes to get this full MRI, that might really hurt that sick child. That might be really unhealthy or have bad health outcomes when you're sedating sick infants for a long time so you can collect this full image X, okay? So instead, if you could only sedate them you know, much less so that they only have to be still for 30 seconds and you can collect a quarter of the information in X, but you do it randomly, you're willing to pay that supercomputer price to solve for S and invert to get the full image if it means that you're you know, maybe saving infants' lives. Okay, so it's very expensive, but sometimes it's worth it to measure a dramatic subsample of the measurements and infer what the non-zero coefficients were. Other examples, you just literally can't measure the full resolution X, and so you try to design some randomized measurements Y where you can infer the non-zero Fourier coefficients. Okay, uh, that was a lot of math. We're going to talk more about this, and I'm going to help you build more intuition for why this L1 norm is so useful uh, in this compressed sensing problem for promoting sparsity. All right, thank you.